You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. As our cities grow and expand into the surrounding forests, it may appear as though we're carving into virgin land never tended to by human hand. However, there are people among us working hard to identify and understand the vague signs of past construction and infrastructure hidden in plain sight right in our own backyards. Or in this case, right in the backyard of the big box stores we pile into for bargain store prices on the artifacts some future civilization may use to better understand us. The focus of tonight's episode will be on the Bears Lake Mystery Walls, an archaeological site in Halifax, Nova Scotia that has stumped historians and archaeologists alike since its discovery just over 25 years ago. In this episode, we'll hear the story of these mystery walls by three guests who've invested a considerable personal expense in the mystery of these walls. Our guests will be Jack McNabb, the founder of the site, Terry J. DeVoe, who's been researching the site and its surrounding area, and John Bignall, who leads a subcommittee of the Nova Scotia Archaeological Society focused on further protecting and researching the mystery walls. During this episode, we'll discuss the site, its modern discovery, what's known about its history, and what's being done today to better understand and protect it. So welcome to the Bears Lake Mystery Walls. Tucked away inconspicuously, just footsteps away from a major shopping and business park, the Bears Lake Mystery Walls sit moss-covered just out of sight behind the tree line that abuts the roadway. The site itself is an enigma. In the most basic terms, the Bears Lake Mystery Walls is an area containing several stacked stone structures of unknown age, use, or origin. Educated guesses put the original construction sometime between the 16th and 17th centuries, during the early settlement of Halifax. As far as the theories on the site's purpose, that ranges from the more grounded ones, like military or or agricultural origins, to the more mysterious ones, like the site being a witch's burial ground, a Knights Templar treasure cache, or having some relationship with the long-fabled Oak Island treasure site. As far as the layout of this site, its largest structure, and the one from which it gets its name, is a 150 meter long wall built using mortar-free stack stone. This wall, which is just over 4 feet tall and just under 4 feet thick, is built following a winding path along the crest of a natural cliff line that divides the area from the nearby business park. Where the wall creates a line rather than an enclosed space, It's hard to think of a practical agricultural or farming purpose for the walls. However, this would make for an ideal defensive structure, as from behind the wall, looking off the cliff, you're met with a panoramic view of the areas surrounding lakes and what in the modern day is a business park. That said, a search of the historical records doesn't uncover any property lines, military fortifications, or any reason for such a wall to be built on the site. Now, despite the 150 meter long wall giving the site its name, there are several more equally enigmatic structures in the moderately forested area immediately behind these walls. The other most significant site is what's referred to as the five-sided structure. This area, to me, looks like an ancient building's foundation, again built using mortar-free stacked stones about waist-high and equally wide. If it is the foundation of a building, several of its features are quite puzzling, first being its shape. A five-sided foundation would have to support a non-usual building design. Next, this structure has a wide opening in one of the five sides, which would be an unusual feature for a building foundation. Further complicating that is the fact that the structure is built on on on-level bedrock, making the foundation's floor slanted non-even. And lastly, within the five-sided structure is a separate, fully enclosed stack stone square. This area could possibly be used as a cellar for domestic purposes or an ammunition storage area if the building's original use was military. Now, aside from the 150-meter wall and this five-sided structure, 
is the site's third mysterious construction. This one I've always called the Stairs to Nowhere. It's basically a set of stone stairs that climb a steep rock-faced cliff roughly 20 feet high. When one climbs the stairs, you enter an area devoid of any obvious reasons to go up there. So basically, there are stairs to nowhere. The only thing of possible significance I've been able to find there is an odd rock feature embedded into the stone you're standing on that many refer to as the snake due to its appearance as resembling a coiled snake. Geologists have looked at this anomaly in the stone and have said it's a natural rock formation and not something man-made. Although, to the untrained eye, I admit it's quite unusual looking. Now, to me personally, what's even more impressive than the Bears Lake Mystery Wall's physical structure is the feeling one gets standing amongst such age-worn mystery. Describing the mood of the site with words is difficult. It's hard to convey the feeling you get when you pass some of the least magical places our society has to offer, like Walmart and Burger King, and step into the woods such a short distance away only to be faced with ancient, mysterious, moss-covered stone structures that some forgotten, nameless people constructed for a purpose long lost to history. The contrast is incredible. And it really goes to show that, despite the monotony of our modern world, there are mysteries waiting to be unearthed just below our noses. Now I'll let that be my segue into my discussion with Jack McNabb. He's a former resident of Halifax who now lives in Austria. Jack is the man personally responsible for the site being brought to the attention of the public, as just over 25 years ago, when he happened upon the area, he knew it was something special, and he went right to the press with it. I've read so many different accounts about the discovery of the mystery walls. Now that I have you on the line, tell me the story of what led to the discovery of the site. Yeah. Well, I'll try to keep the first part short in the sense that I moved from Truro, Nova Scotia, where I grew up in 1985 to Bedford, Nova Scotia. And I had a carpet cleaning business. Because of the carpet cleaning business, I could be, you know, down uh, Lawrence Town in the morning cleaning carpets. And I could be in Peggy's Cove cleaning the carpets in the afternoon. And then back in Sackville. So I was just all over the place all the time, every day. I got interested in the woods. And when I was driving around, I'd always be looking at the rocks and the trees. And I got wondering, I wonder where the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq people lived in the woods. I wonder if I could maybe see some of their you know, evidence of them being in there. So this created the, the first thing going in the woods. And I was having some issues over the chemicals from carpet cleaning that could, was causing some problems. And I needed more fresh air. So I'd go into the woods here and there and everywhere. And then you may be aware that I I discovered some stone carvings that didn't look like Mi'kmaq. And then I discovered some foundations, some, you know, 1800 foundations in around Bedford and Sackville. And then I got very interested in finding foundations, stone foundations, for whatever reason it, it, it led to that. I wanted to see if I could find more. And I was constantly going into surveyor shops photo places over in Burnside, businesses that were specialists in that field of aerial photographs. And I, I and I went into one place one day, was talking to the guy, and he said, what are you interested in? And I said, I'm looking for stone walls. And then he said, well, I'll tell you where there's stone walls. I know right exactly where there's stone walls. And this was the beginning. And of course, it's, it's the now Bears Lake Industrial Park, right? But it wasn't a park then, really. It, there were, there, yeah, there was some buildings and businesses there, but it was like a wilderness. Okay, and when was this? What year? This was 1990, so this was after <clears throat> being in Bedford in the area for five years. So in 1990, on a wet day, I went up to the Bicentennial Highway, and because I couldn't get in it from the other side, you know, there was no roads like we have now. So I pulled up on the side of the highway where, where it turned down, going, you know, so you could go to Peggy's Cove or going around. But I was right on the bicentennial. So then I went into the woods, and uh, it was a real wet day. And I went in. I couldn't find nothing. I was, I was a bit discouraged. I knew where the spot was. In the aerial photographs, you couldn't see the walls. It was just nothing but trees. So that was my first attempt. I, you know, I went here, there, zigzagged, everything. And then I came back again on a second time. Same results. I couldn't find it. And then the third time I went in, I mean, I was discouraged. Once again, wet. As you you may realize in the woods, when it's wet, you really get wet. Yes. 
So I went in down these slopes. I mean, I was really discouraged. And I was wondering, this guy was misleading me, you know. You know, was it even significant walls or anything? Then I turned around, I looked up, and I said, wow. I was looking up at the walls, at one portion of the walls, looking up, looking away from Burnside towards the Bicentennial Highway. And then I came up, and I just couldn't believe my eyes. I just, I said, what's going on here? Like, really? This is big. I was in another world altogether. It was a... The biggest high I think I ever got in my life. I just couldn't believe it. So then I crawled up to where the walls were, and I, I, I found one section, and I started following it. This would be, I think, the opposite end, you know, where the foundation is, a, yeah. the little house foundation. Yeah. Well, it would be further down the other end of the wall, where it peters out. So I started following it there, and I kept walking and walking, and then I come to that big natural stone wall. Uh, formation that's there. You have to walk over top of that to come down to the other part of the walls. Well, when I was up there looking down, I couldn't believe my eyes to see another section of this walls. So then I came down, I followed that, and I, I, you know, I was just astounded. And it's not clear to me right now as to when I found that five-sided foundation. I don't know if I found it that first day or another time when I went in. But when I did find that, I mean, my mind was just totally blown. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. From there, that's when I decided I had to do something about this. This is big. And the question was, who do I go and tell this to, to make sure that the public knows? Yeah. And, and when you found the site, I'm just curious, what kind of condition was the, the, the growth of the forest? And like now when I, I've been there recently and it's a, there's yeah. a bit of paths from some foot traffic and there's the <laughs> signage protecting the site. How grown in was it when you initially found it? It was totally thick, everything. There were, you had a hard time walking. It was as if no one had ever walked on that area for 200 years or 300, or I was even thinking before Columbus came to America. But it was just dense bush, brush, weeds, and trees. But it was the bushes that were the problem. To come back and try to find the same walls that I found was very difficult. Each time I came, I kept coming back, trip after trip. But it was still uh, seriously hard to refine. You just didn't walk in off the highway. And bang, there you were. Yeah, and even now, it's hard to find the different areas. In fact, I myself, sure. I've been able to find everything except the uh, the longer actual wall. I found uh, when I showed up initially, the five sided structure was the first thing I happened upon. Then I found the I think they refer to it the staircase to nowhere. The the stairs that seem to be carved or, or <laughs> lined up on the rock. That's a good term. Yeah. The stairway to nowhere. Yeah, because you, you just get up there and you don't see anything. And then you find, uh, I don't know if you've been involved in this, but when you climb the top of the stairway to nowhere, there's an odd kind of carving or formation into a rock there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's been researched. And I'll tell you the honest truth. And it was Terry J. DeVoe of Halifax County that broke the news to me that that's not really a carving. Yeah. It's actually a natural formation that can be found you know, in various places in Nova Scotia, which I think a lot of people may be disappointed to hear because it does look like a snake, doesn't it, a bit? It is, and it's just an odd-looking uh, formation. I did do a bit of research myself uh, online. I was in touch with um, a group of geologists and, and showed them the formation or carving or whatever you call it to ask right. them if it appeared to be something man-made, and they immediately told me that that's a, a common natural formation. Well, I shouldn't say common. It's a known formation, uh, but yeah. not very common. And they had given me uh, photographs and links to other areas w with photos of very similar looking uh, formations in rock. Mind you, I never saw one anywhere else, but that's the news I got too, that they're, they're calm and, you know, or, or they're known by geologists and that. And, um, and whenever Terry DeVoe concludes, makes a conclusion on something, I'm comfortable with it. He's a very accurate man. He's a scientist and he knows the composition of stone. So I don't usually argue with him when he puts something on the table. When you initially found this, the site, did, did you have any theory as to what it was? Well, I'm the type of person I love to think in terms of somebody being in Nova Scotia before Columbus discovered America. So, I mean, I, that's that's the way I think, you know. And I and really, I was not a historian or anything before I came to Bedford. You know, I had a basic interest in Oak Island and things like that. But my and of course, then I grew in knowledge after finding these stone carvings that were not Mi'kmaq carvings were native uh, people of Nova Scotia and that's where my my concepts of thinking of people coming before Columbus start with but at that time I just uh, concluded and I, I you know I even mentioned in the newspaper because I you know I invited the newspaper up on purpose because I wanted the world to know 
and thankfully they came out. They, from the newspaper, invited Bob Oglevy, the curator of the museum, to come up the same day on a Saturday, and Dr. Stephen Davis, the head anthropologist of the Maritimes, who was studying, teaching, I should say, at St. Mary's University, he came up, and they were astounded too. Dr. Stephen Davis said it looked kind of Celtic, you know, so he's seen some of these same types of walls in um, Ireland, England, and places like that. But no, I, I was um, I was really taken up with this idea of um, before Columbus, and so to date, I mean, I don't really have any answers as to who really built. It. I mean, this has been going on for years. The, the the talk about who might have done it, the, as well as the purpose for it, like just as the example, the the five sided uh, structure is just so odd. For one, the shape, and secondly, it has the enclosed area that no one's really been able to explain. I've he- I've heard a few different theories as to what that could be for, but nothing that really very conclusive. So I would say at this point, my honest opinion is because Terry J. DeVoe has gone into a tremendous amount of study. He he got in touch with me after I returned to Truro. And he said, Jack, I've been trying to get a hold of you for eight years. And what he has done during those eight years, he looked at every discovery I made in all of Halifax County. And he took a tremendous interest in uh, the Bears Lake Walls. I call, I coined that name, the Mystery Walls. Great. Good marketing sense. Yeah. Well, I, I tried to think things out because I knew I had one shot to put it before the public. And I had to get it as right as I could, but not to say that I thought it was a certain thing. But uh, the thing with Terry, he discovered in that area... He discovered things way bigger than the mystery walls, and it spreads out a long ways to the two chain lakes there. And I think this is public knowledge, because I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't think so. Terry's given talks around the city about my discovery and showed pictures and everything. But he's discovered roads and other things, and they're not so visible to the naked eye as the mystery walls themselves. But he shows you clearly how there was water ducts and things. So whatever decision Terry J. DeVoe makes, I'm going to go with that the highest confidence in his insight. He's got it down to a real science. And I think what's most incredible is to think that there's a site like that in the center of the, the shopping district, Bears Lake. I think it will be a surprise to a lot of people to hear that there's something that, that's that mysterious, that has archaeologists and scientists stumped. And on top of that, it involves a carpet cleaner who in his spare time is looking for uh, old foundations and finding stones. So the whole story, I just don't know why there's not a movie about this yet. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's been some coverage. It was on any documentary there one time, just but not much. Just showed one photo. I guess they filmed it over and over, all kinds of video and everything. But they basically just used one photo to show one little piece of the wall. But like you say, it's amazing that there isn't more done, more focus on it. Upon finding it, you said you didn't know who to call. Can you just kind of talk through what step you've taken uh, immediately after finding it? Yeah, well, that was the trick. Turns out there there were other people that were aware of those walls. It's just that they didn't know what to do about them. They didn't know what they were. Everybody thought it was just an old farm site of some sort. I had to make a decision where to go, go to the museum or go to the paper. And I felt if I went to the museum, maybe it just might get sealed in a package and be forgotten about. So I went to the paper, and I forget the gentleman's name, but it was Halifax Herald. And then he was the person that contacted Dr. Stephen Davis from St. Mary's University and Bob Oglevy, the head curator of the museum in Halifax. So then they, they came up. We were all there together. And everyone was astounded. Well, Bob Oglevy, he decided we'll put it under the Nova Scotia Special Places Act. And that's when it was done that, that day, basically. And it still remains there to this day. I- Unfortunately, and as you may be aware, there has been a very serious damage done to the five-sided stone foundation. Someone rebuilt that. Some individual went in there and reconstructed it, put all the stones back in the place where he thinks thought they should be. But unfortunately, he's done such damage to it, it can't be reconstructed the way it probably originally was. He's, you know, he's got it in the right order. You know, he didn't damage just the shape of it, but it's just very serious. I have read of that, and that's why there's so much concern to bring publicity to the walls for fear of just people getting involved. I've also read uh, some news reports of vandalism on the walls. Some people had knocked a lot of the rocks off the actual the actual wall. I think uh, in Halifax, the Coast newspaper. Uh, and there was a lot of rocks off, even when I found it, that were probably done by nature. You know, over the years, possibly I don't know, but and that area is getting swallowed up by development as well. 
because it's unbelievable. It's, but I think if I hadn't gone to the media with this, th those walls would have been gone long ago. Next time someone tells you that nothing interesting happens in or around Halifax, let them know the story of the carpet cleaner who treated his chemical exposure by walking through the woods only to find an archaeological mystery that's yet to be explained over 25 years later. I'm happy to know someone as interesting as Jack McNabb, and I'm proud to call him a friend. Now, as Jack described his history with the Bears Lake mystery walls, he made several references to another researcher, Terry J. DeVoe. In the preparation for this episode, nearly all the research I did on these walls in some way made reference or led me back to Mr. DeVoe's ongoing research into them and the surrounding area. Jack McNabb was kind enough to get me in touch with Terry, and Terry was generous enough to give me some time to ask him some questions about his work trying to crack the mystery of the Bears Lake Mystery Walls. Currently work as a senior scientist in uh, ocean acoustics for JASCO, which is a, a local firm that does underwater-based uh, applied sciences research and acoustic predictions, which is my particular field, underwater modeling, underwater sound modeling. I understand you take on archaeology and history more as, as a hobby. What led to that? Well, living in Nova Scotia, you're surrounded by all kinds of great history, and uh, I was drawn to some of the more uh, esoteric aspects of it, and frankly, a tour of Oak Island uh, back in the 70s sparked my interest uh, in parts of history that seemed unexplained or radical, and I just started branching off from there, investigating uh, other types of history that um, is not always explained in the textbooks. Uh, but on top of that, being of Acadian heritage, uh, I took a great deal of interest in Acadian history as well. So that was another focus, has been another focus of, of my interests, and uh, as well as Acadian genealogy, studying my family history, which turned out to be even more interesting than I ever thought it would be. To get to our topic of the, the Bears Lake Mystery Walls, how did you first hear about these? walls? Well, I guess it was from a newspaper article at first, back uh, in the in the 90s. When the article came out, I initially went to try to find them, and I couldn't find them then. But in uh, 2002, um, some of my uh, contacts in the area told me that they did know how to find them. So once I got more detailed instructions, that was the first time I was able to actually see them uh, live and in person. Okay, so you probably read the article that Jack McNabb spoke about earlier. Yes, when it was first published, I did. Now, again, anything I've ever read about the wall seems to direct me back to you. How did you become so involved? I had already been looking at old ruins, and when I saw these particular old ruins, they were the most exciting ones I had found so far. So it seemed like, since they also were quite close to where I lived, that I should take it on as a project and see if I could find out whatever there was to learn about them, both on the land and also going through archival records to see uh, if there had been settlements recorded in the area or any other kind of engineering activities that, that might explain uh, the presence of the wall, such as military works. And really, I just tried to cover every uh, angle that I could think of in terms of uh, looking for clues that might be an actual explanation for what was there. I'm probably jumping the gun, but at, at this point in your research, are you able to comment on any of your theories you have regarding the building or the builders of the walls or the purpose of the walls? I could comment on it, but to get to the final uh, word, I think it's too early to have a final word. The thing is, being a scientist, I'm totally focused on evidence-based research. So we look for any evidence that we can find that will lead us to answers. So that's what I'm doing. At this point, the evidence does give some information, uh, mainly that the walls themselves appear to be militarily defensive in nature. So if you look at other reasons why people build walls, the evidence seems to be against them, like field clearing, for example, or property boundary, or a corral for animals. And, you know, come up with any other ideas you can of why people would build a wall. The evidence does not seem to fit 
in this case. However, for a military wall, it is a better fit, although not a perfect fit, but it is a better fit. So that's about as much as I can say. Now, the other thing is the age of the walls is a big problem because as we know, Halifax was founded in 1749. Residential activity and, and the military activity that we know of dates to that point in time and, and later. So most people who look at this would automatically assume, okay, we had to have uh, happened post-1749. But the problem is that we don't have any records uh, for that time period that that can explain the building of the walls. And one would think there would be some for especially military walls of this nature. So it, it creates, uh, this is why people term it a mystery, uh, because the, the answers are not quick and they're not clear. And, and we're still trying to find where the evidence really does lead. As far as the five-sided structure, that's a very odd shape and a very odd looking structure. Can you talk at all about any theories you may have or anything you're working on in, in understanding that? Well, uh, it appears to be some kind of a foundation. I mean, it, the five-sided foundation uh, is unlikely to have served any purpose uh, just simply as, as a five-sided stone uh, polygon. Uh, especially since there is a sort of root cellar type of uh, cubby hole built into one of the sides. So it most likely was covered with something, whether there was a building over it or perhaps a tent kind of structure over it. Those are possibilities. Now to say, you know, any more than that, I don't think we have the evidence that can go much farther than that at this point. There was an interesting uh, discovery made by some of the archeologists uh, that work at Lewisburg uh, about some of the British siege works that were used during the last uh, siege of Lewisburg in 1758. They did find some somewhat similar type foundations that were used to provide a, a weather uh, resistant floor to, to a canvas uh, tent-like structure. So it's sort of a combination of uh, stone foundation, wooden platform, and, and tent overstructure to, to keep people basically from having to sleep in the mud and the, and the, and the puddles of water. So, you know, there, it may have a parallel here, but we just, you know, it's, we're just speculating. It also could have had, had a, a totally wooden uh, building on top of it. Chances are that whatever was there was so long ago that um, there'd be very little left of it and just kind of rotted away, whatever it was. And as far as putting a date on it, the most consistent thing I seem to find in my research was putting it at, at minimum 200 years old. Is there anything you can say about possibly dating it? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, because if there were anything younger than that, then we probably would see some bits of rotted wood uh, at least, especially, you know, if there were big timbers. Uh, but um, no, there's not even the slightest hint of that anywhere. One thing to realize is that the site has a number of components. So there is a five-sided foundation that we've been talking about. And there's also a second foundation associated with the site, which is often called the, uh, the small foundation or, or just the second foundation. That is probably a more complicated ruin. There's evidence that that is the more recent structure on the site. It actually shows up on some maps from the early 20th century, uh, you know, sort of as like a, a building uh, icon on, on some of the early mapping. There are also quarries nearby that are known to have been worked in the early 20th century. So one possible angle is that it was some kind of a hut related to the work that was being done in the quarries at that time. And, and you can also still trace uh, the outline of what appears to have been uh, a square foundation um, that would have supported a building. Some, some actual archaeological excavation has been done around the second or small foundation area. And they did uncover small artifacts of various sorts that are consistent with a use in the early 20th century. Also could have been a hunting cabin because uh, some things like shells and uh, bottle caps and that sort of thing were found in association with it. But I mean, even if it was a quarry shed, it no, nothing to stop it from also having been used by hunters, you know, after the quarrymen were gone. One has to realize that whenever you're going back in the past like this, things usually turn out to be more complicated than, you know, a sort of uh, single story uh, idea that, that first comes to mind. 
you know, lots of things happen in the past and your initial idea of, of what it could have been often turns out to be only one part of the picture. I understand you've been researching the greater area surrounding the walls. That's you, right. You referred to it to me as the Chain Lakes Watershed Study Area. That's right. Uh, can you discuss your, your findings or your research there and how the, the Bears Lake Wall site fit into that? Right. Well, my idea at first was uh, having fairly thoroughly combed the area around the walls themselves in terms of just uh, looking for other walls or other foundations or uh, quarries, which there are quite a few quarries, and roads, which again, there are quite a few roads. It became evident to me that if this is part of something big, uh, and I didn't know whether it would be or not, then it would have to be connected to more stuff like foundations of living quarters or you know some other some other type of uh, engineering works like if it was a mine perhaps or there were more roads so that's why i began to look for those things the whole area one of the good things about it is that it was set aside most of it was set aside in 1846 as a watershed so it is a protected area it's the property of the uh, halifax uh, water at this point they really don't like people uh, wandering all over their property but uh, i did get permission from the um, uh, admin people there at the time i began my work to uh, you know use the site for for this research purpose so i in fact i did find a lot of interesting things uh, that i believe do i believe i can show do connect back to the mystery wall site. So yeah, in, in the end, I, I did find that it was a larger site. On the site, uh, either the broader site or the mystery wall site, what currently, what type of research is being done there? Well, the property where the walls themselves are located is uh, owned by the city of Halifax and was originally slated to be part of the Bears Lake uh, Business Park. But through the efforts of Jack McNabb and other people like that, they did manage to get the area set aside as a protected area. The city is aware of that. There, to my knowledge, the city is currently working on a, uh, a management plan for the historic site. Uh, so the idea is to not only protect the site from development, but also to uh, make it a place where people can visit and, and have interpretive panels and you know have it available to the public. But in parallel with that, is to do some serious uh, archaeological research to try to find out uh, the, the real story uh, as to when these walls were built and by whom. So that is going to require funding. And I think that's part of the whole uh, effort that uh, the city of Halifax is currently trying to um, come up with a definite plan as to what to do and how to fun fund it. And so uh, we're hoping that there'll be some uh, some results of that uh, of that work before too long. You've talked a lot about the threat of development in the area. What would you say currently is the main threat that uh, is present in the site? Would it be the development in the area or unauthorized study by amateurs? Unauthorized disturbance of the site is definitely uh, the, the biggest threat right now because it's it's a very real thing. I mean, I hate to tell you, but people that uh, go up there and, and poke around and uh, disturb the site or doing a tremendous amount of damage. That is very real. Development is encroaching. The newer buildings are getting closer and closer, which although the newer buildings uh, do not, so far as we know, actually damage the archaeological potential, nevertheless, it does take away a lot from the aesthetics of it uh, in the f sense that the newer constructed buildings are now well within the site of, of the old ruins. So it takes away a lot of, of the um, ancient feel of the place. You know, when I first saw it, it was totally uh, lost in the wilderness, whereas now it feels like it's just a little pocket uh, oasis of wilderness surrounded by big buildings. Yeah, I... I I'll, I'll admit it, I visited the site myself and I was surprised to park in what looked like any office building and, and see it so close to the road. But you know, what is being done today to enhance the protection of the site? You've mentioned the, the city of Halifax has been working on, on stuff, but how does the day-to-day the -day look for that? 
Well, uh, the Nova Scotia Archaeologist Society has formed a subcommittee for advocacy of the Bears Lake uh, Walls Historic Site. One of my colleagues, John Bignall, is the chairman of that subcommittee, and he serves on the board of, of the Archaeologist Society as well. So he's been working closely with uh, city officials and the MLA, and uh, we even had the Deputy Premier, um, Diana Whalen, out to visit the site last year. I can't really tell you exactly uh, what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, but I know these folks that I just mentioned are, are definitely on, on task and they're certainly working on it. Hopefully we will uh, we'll get some results on that. Now, now Terry, is, is there anything else you'd like to say about the site or any, any other interesting facts or, or, or details you'd like to share? Well, I mean, I just want to emphasize that uh, in, in any study like this, there's a lot of things that are super interesting to someone like me. Not all of them will be connected right back to the uh, Bears Lake Mystery Walls. Uh, and, and it's actually a real challenge to, to sort it out and to figure out what parts are connected and which ones are not. So I found um, networks of, of old roads, for example. So uh, some of the roads appear to lead back to the Mystery Wall site and other ones don't. And uh, the roads, you know, obviously uh, overlap to some degree. And so is it a coincidence or are they actually connected? Were they built by the same people to be used at the same time? Roads are just one example. I found a whole bunch of other things as well, like walls and uh, foundation holes. Uh, so it is a challenge. I just want to caution, you know, anybody who who's, uh, happens to see something, uh, please don't disturb it. Don't just assume that it's nothing. It might be something very significant. Uh, so that's really a, a serious problem we have of people who just um, come across things and, and want to, um, they're curious, look under this stone or something like that. And, and it really only does damage. It cannot, uh, cannot help at all. It's best to, to just leave things untouched uh, in every case. After speaking with Terry, I'm beginning to think that Bears Lake Mystery Walls have met their match. Before we conclude this episode, I want to take a moment and include some statements surrounding the delicacy of the Mystery Walls and the steps being taken to protect them. As I've learned during the production of this episode, there exists a subcommittee within the Nova Scotia Archaeological Society tasked with the protection and preservation of these Mystery Walls. I reached out to the chairman of the committee, John Bignall, and invited him to share some of his thoughts on the site and the efforts being made to preserve them. I think like everyone in Nova Scotia, we, I think Nova Scotians have a keen interest in history. We have a long standing history throughout Canada. You know, we're such a, an old province and an old soul society. A history that plays a big role and for me there's so much history in our community so much history in Halifax but this this location in Bears Lake it just seemed so uh, unique and uh, for me I went looking for it I couldn't find it couldn't find it and no one would really tell you where it was at. it's kind of this secret it's a mystery and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out you know, why and who and lots of articles lots of information and finally one day when I came across it after spending pretty much the whole summer trying to find this location and found this amazing ruins. Uh, the site was just um, opened up more questions than answers. And from there, it just kind of became a, a point of interest for me. I started reading more articles, uh, trying to find people that were interested and keen on this location. But a, a key moment happened for me was when uh, damage started occurring. And I noticed people were going up there and moving rocks and repositioning rocks. And just the, the volume of people, because of the nature of the internet, they would find a picture or they find a comment on Reddit or a comment on uh, Twitter, and then people would go looking for it. It became easier and easier as development encroached on the site throughout uh, the 90s into 2000 that people were able to find it a whole lot easier. And it, there was one article I read, I think it was on a Yahoo group, and someone had gone up there with a metal detector and found a medallion and found a bunch of uh, significant artifacts and I tried contacting this person saying listen I'm, I'm not interested in getting in trouble I'm not interested in in you know uh, pulling you down to the Nova Scotia Museum or taking you down to the, the police station I just want to know what you found exactly 
and you know what you know how deep some information because I think it could have very much dated the location. The person removed the post and disappeared, and by all means, uh, that was gone forever. So was it real? Was it not real? But to find the object that he was referring to would be quite significant. Well, my involvement when I started looking at kind of stakeholders and who can I get to help me protect this area with all this damage being done, more traffic going there, uh, people going there with the metal detectors, not realizing that was a protected site. Uh, it, for me, it became a, kind of a passion, a desire to look after this site. I joined the Nova Scotia Archaeological Society, went to them saying, what can we do? What should be done? And where do we start? And like most groups, you know, people are busy, people are, are focused on other things. Uh, a lot of you know, political uh, maneuvering that was happening within the group, within the government, within the city. And it really I had a lot of, you know, roadblocks and challenges. I worked professionally as a paramedic, so I had no background in this field. But I had a passion for history and a passion to try to figure out what was going on. And when I started looking at what needed to be done and talking to people, I found that we needed to, to form a group. We needed to look after this area uh, and that's where I said, let's bring all the people that are interested, all the people that are emailing me, people that are keen, people that are passionate about this site, and form a subcommittee that is going to specifically look at this site and try to figure out what we can do for it. And that's really where this group, the subcommittee, uh, formed. We brought professionals, we brought experts, we brought uh, you know just general people that are passionate together in one table saying, well, where do we start? And the first idea was, well, we need to talk to the, the landowner. The problem comes in, Halifax owns the land. It's a, their property, their area. But Nova Scotia government actually governs it, so they control what can be done on it. So you have two levels of government that need to work together to make sure that they, they understand the value, understand the need, and then approve it. So we need the landowner to go, yeah, it's okay to put that shovel there. And then Special Places Act go, yeah, it's okay for you to put that shovel there. And the two of them agreeing on a course of action. And that's been the biggest challenge that I face right now is trying to get both parties at the table saying, yeah, this is the course of action. This is uh, what should happen. This is what we need to do next. I want to thank Jack Terry and John for taking the time to share this incredible story with me and more importantly for their tireless efforts towards all things Bears Lake Mystery Walls. Now I want to end this episode by asking any listeners of Nighttime who feel compelled to visit the site to please be respectful. Don't disturb anything and leave the site exactly as it was when you found it. Unless you see litter, you can pick up the litter. And with that, we'll conclude this episode of Nighttime. If you're interested in hearing more content, please check out the Nighttime Patron Group, where for $1 a month, you can support the show and access supporter-exclusive bonus content, such as exclusive videos, bonus audios, and prior episodes that are no longer available in this main feed. You can join by visiting patreon.com slash nighttimepodcast. I'd like to thank the current patrons of the show for making this show possible, and welcome the newest members to the group. For anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you use. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities both on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or feedback from the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. So until next time, keep looking around and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.